10 billion dollars. I mean, just speak about the magnitude of that. That is by far the biggest uh, commitment of the foundation, isn't it, Bill? I mean, this is this is by far the largest. That's right. We've been spending a lot on vaccines. Uh, with this commitment, uh, over 8 million additional lives will be saved. So it's one of the most effective ways that uh, health in the poorest countries can be dramatically improved. In January of 2010, Bill and Melinda Gates used the World Economic Forum at Davos to announce a staggering $10 billion commitment to research and develop vaccines for the world's poorest countries, kicking off what he called a decade of vaccines. Today we're announcing a commitment over this next decade, uh, which we think of as a, a decade of uh, vaccines having incredible impact. Uh, we're announcing that uh, we'll spend over $10 billion on vaccines. Hailed by the Gates-funded media. For the record, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is a news hour underwriter. And applauded by the pharmaceutical companies who stood to reap the benefits of that largesse. The record-setting commitment made waves in the international community, helping to underwrite a global vaccine action plan coordinated by the Gates-funded World Health Organization. But contrary to the Gates' own PR spin that this $10 billion pledge was an unalloyed good and would save 8 million lives, the truth is that this attempt to reorient the global health economy was part of a much bigger agenda. An agenda that would ultimately lead to greater profits for big pharma companies, greater control for the Gates Foundation over the field of global health, and greater power for Bill Gates to shape the course of the future for billions of people around the planet. This is Bill Gates' plan to vaccinate the world. You're tuned into The Corbett Report. Given Gates' pledge to make this a decade of vaccines, it should come as no surprise that, since the dawn of this coronavirus crisis, he has been adamant that the world will not go back to normal until a vaccine has been developed. But we're going to have this intermediate period of opening up, uh, and it won't be normal until we get a, an amazing vaccine uh, to the entire world. The vaccine is, is critical because until you have that, things aren't really going to be normal. They can open up to some degree, but the risk of a rebound will be there until we have very broad vaccination. Well, they won't be back to normal until we either have that phenomenal vaccine or a therapeutic that's like over 95% effective. And so we have to assume that's going to be almost 18 months from now. And then the final solution, uh, which is a year to two years off, is the vaccine. So we've got to mm -hmm. go full speed ahead on all three fronts. Uh, just to head off the conspiracy theorists, maybe we shouldn't call the vaccine the final solution. Maybe just the Good best point. solution. <laughs> okay. More interestingly, since Gates began delivering this same talking point in every one of his many media appearances of late, it has been picked up and repeated by heads of state, health officials, doctors, and media talking heads, right down to the scientifically arbitrary but very specific 18-month time frame. Realistically, COVID-19 will be here for the next 18 months or more. We will not be able to return to normalcy until we find a vaccine or effective medications. The hard fact is, until we find a vaccine, going back to normal means putting lives at risk. This will be the new normal until a vaccine is developed. The only thing that will really allow life as we once knew it to resume is a vaccine. Obviously, we continue to work on the vaccines, but the vaccines have to be down the road by probably 14, 15, 16 months. We're doing great on the vaccines. The fact that so many heads of state, health ministers, and media commentators are dutifully echoing Gates's pronouncements about the need for a vaccine will not be surprising to those who saw last week's exploration of how Bill Gates monopolized global health. As we have seen, the Gates Foundation's tentacles have penetrated into every corner of the field of public health. Billions of dollars in funding and entire public policy agendas are under the control of this man, an unelected, unaccountable software developer with no medical research experience or training. And nowhere is Gates' control of public health more apparent than in the realm of vaccines. Gates launched the decade of vaccines with a $10 billion pledge. 
Gates helped develop the Global Vaccine Action Plan administered by the Gates-funded World Health Organization. Gates helped found Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, aiming to develop healthy markets for vaccine manufacturers. Gates helped launch Gavi with a $1 billion donation in 2011, going on to contribute $4.1 billion over the course of the decade of vaccines. And so I'm pleased to announce to you that we're pledging an additional billion dollars uh, to... Thank you. All right, thank you. It's not every day we give away a billion uh, dollars. One of the Gates Foundation's core funding areas is vaccine development and surveillance, which has resulted in the channeling of billions of dollars into vaccine development, a seat at the table to develop vaccination campaigns in countries around the globe, and the opportunity to shape public thinking about Bill Gates' pet project of the past five years, preparing rapid development and deployment of vaccines in the event of a globally spreading pandemic. If anything kills over 10 million people in the next few decades, it's most likely to be a highly infectious virus. Whether it occurs by the quirk of nature at the hand of a terrorist, epidemiologists show through their models that a respiratory spread pathogen would kill more than 30 million people in less than a year. And there is a reasonable probability of that taking place in the years ahead. Many high-profile personalities have been gathering at this year's World Economic Forum in Davos, which aims to discuss and deal with the globe's most pressing issues. Amongst them is the Microsoft founder Bill Gates. His foundation is investing millions in the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations to help combat infectious diseases. Here's some of what he had to say about his push to develop new vaccines. Unfortunately, it takes many years to do a completely new vaccine. The design, the, the safety reviews, Costs. the manufacturing, all those things uh, mean that uh, an epidemic can be very widespread before that tool would come along. And so after Ebola, the global health community talked a lot about this, uh, including an, a new type of uh, vaccine platform called DNA RNA mm. that should speed things along. And so uh, this Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Initiative, CEPI, CEPI, <laughs> uh, is uh, three countries, Japan, Norway, Germany, and two foundations. Uh, Welcome Trust, uh, who we work with on a lot of things in our foundation, Gates Foundation, uh, coming together to fund uh, uh, actually trying to use that platform and make uh, some vaccines, and so that would help us in the future. We know vaccines can protect us. We just need to be better prepared. So let's come together. Let's research. And invest. Let's save lives. Let's, Let's outsmart, outsmart epidemics. epidemics. Given Gates' mammoth investment in vaccines over the past decade, his insistence that things won't go back to truly normal until we have a vaccine that we've gotten out to basically the entire world. Is hardly surprising. What should be surprising is that this strangely specific and continuously repeated message, that we will not go back to normal until we get a vaccine in 18 months, has no scientific basis whatsoever. Medical researchers have already conceded that a vaccine for SARS-CoV-2 may not even be possible, pointing to the inability of researchers to develop any kind of immunization against previous coronavirus outbreaks, like SARS or MERS. But even if such a vaccine were possible, serious concerns remain about the safety of developing, testing, and delivering such an amazing vaccine to the entire world in this remarkably short time frame. 
even proponents of vaccine development openly worry that the rush to vaccinate billions of people with a largely untested experimental coronavirus vaccine will itself present grave risks to the public. One of these risks involves disease enhancement. It has been known for over a decade that vaccination for some viral infections, including coronaviruses, actually enhances susceptibility to viral infection or even causes infections in healthy vaccine recipients. Now, the issue of safety, something that I want to make sure the American public understand. It's not only safety when you inject somebody and they get maybe an idiosyncratic reaction, they get a little allergic reaction, they get pain. Their safety associated, does the vaccine make you worse? And there are diseases in which you vaccinate someone, they get infected with what you're trying to protect them with, and you actually enhance the infection. This is no mere theoretical risk. As researchers who were trying to develop a vaccine for the original SARS outbreak discovered, the vaccine actually made the lab animals subjected to it more susceptible to the disease. One of the things that we're not hearing a lot about is the unique potential safety problem of coronavirus vaccines. Uh, this was uh, first found in the early 1960s with the respiratory syncytial virus. Uh, vaccines, at and it was done here in Washington with the NIH and Children's National Medical Center, that some of those kids who got the vaccine actually did worse, and I believe there were two deaths as in, in the consequence of that study. Because what happens with certain types of respiratory virus vaccines, you get immunized, and then when you get actually exposed to the virus, you get this kind of paradoxical immune enhancement phenomenon. And, what how, and, and we, we don't entirely understand the basis of it, but we recognize that it's a real problem for certain respiratory virus vaccines. That killed the RSV program for decades. Now the Gates Foundation is taking it up again. But when we started developing uh, coronavirus vaccines and our colleagues, we noticed in laboratory animals that they started to show some of the same immune pathology that resembled what had happened 50 years earlier. This specific issue regarding coronavirus vaccines is exacerbated by the arbitrary and unscientific 18-month time frame that Gates is insisting on for the vaccine's development. In order to meet that deadline, vaccine developers are being urged to use new and largely unproven methods for creating their experimental immunizations, including DNA and mRNA vaccines. For a self-described wartime president, victory over COVID-19 equals a vaccine. I hope we're going to have a vaccine and, and we're going to fast track it like you've never seen before. Adding Trump-style branding, the administration launched Operation Warp Speed, a multi-billion dollar research and manufacturing effort to shorten the typical year-plus vaccine development timeline. We're going to start ramping up production with the companies involved. And you do that at risk. In other words, you don't wait until you get an answer before you start manufacturing. You at risk proactively start making it, assuming it's going to work. You're thinking 18 months, even with all the work that you've already done to this point and the planning that you are taking with lots of different potential uh, vaccinations and building up for that now? Yeah, so the, there's an approach called the RNA vaccine that people like Moderna, CureVac, uh, and others are using mm -hmm. that in 2015, we'd identified that as very promising uh, for pandemics and for uh, other applications as well. And so if everything goes perfectly uh, with the RNA approach, we could actually beat the 18 months. We don't want to create unrealistic mm -hmm. expectations. So the concept of an RNA vaccine is Let's inject the RNA molecule that encodes for the spike protein. It's making your cell do the work of creating this viral protein that is going to be recognized by your immune system and trigger um, the development of these antibodies. Our bodies won't make a full-fledged infectious virus, they'll just make a little piece and then learn to recognize it and then get ready to destroy the virus if it then later comes and invades us. It's a relatively new, unproven technology. And there's still no example of an RNA vaccine that's been deployed worldwide in the way that we need for the coronavirus. There's the possibility for unforeseen adverse effects. So this is all new territory. Whether it would elicit protective immune response against this virus is just unknown right now. 
rushing at warp speed to develop a new vaccine using experimental technology, and then mass-producing and delivering billions of doses to be injected into basically the entire world before adequate testing is even done, amounts to one of the most dangerous experiments in the history of the world, one that could alter the lives of untold numbers of people. That an experimental vaccine, developed in a brand new way and rushed through with a special shortened testing regime, should be given to adults, children, pregnant women, newborn babies, and the elderly alike, would be, in any other situation, unthinkable. To suggest that such a vaccine should be given to the entire planet would have been called lunacy mere months ago. But now the public is being asked to accept this premise without question. Even Gates himself acknowledges the inherent risks of such a project. But his concern is not for the lives that will be irrevocably altered in the event that the vaccines cause damage to the population. Instead, he is more concerned that the pharmaceutical companies and the researchers are given legal immunity for any such damage. You know, if we have, you know, one in 10,000 uh, side effects, that's, you know, way more, 700,000, uh, you know, people who will suffer from that. So really understanding the safety at gigantic scale across all age ranges, you know, pregnant, male, female, undernourished uh, existing comorbidities, it's very, very hard. And that actual decision of, okay, let's go and give this vaccine to the entire world, uh, governments will have to be involved because there will be some risk and indemnification needed before that can uh, be decided on. As we have already seen, in the arena of global health, what Bill Gates wants is what the world gets. So it should be no surprise that immunity for the big pharma vaccine manufacturers and the vaccination program planners is already being worked on. In the U.S., the Department of Health and Human Services issued a declaration that retroactively provides liability immunity for activities related to medical countermeasures against COVID-19, including manufacturers, distributors, and program planners of any vaccine used to treat, diagnose, cure, prevent, or mitigate COVID-19. The declaration was issued on March 17th, but retroactively covers any activity back to February 4th, 2020, the day before the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation announced an emergency $100 million to fund treatment efforts and to develop new vaccines for COVID-19. The plan to inject everyone on the planet with an experimental vaccine is no aberration in Bill Gates's envisioned decade of vaccines. It is its culmination. The decade of vaccines kicked off with a Gates-funded $3.6 million observational study of HPV vaccines in India that, according to a government investigation, violated the human rights of the study participants with gross violations of consent and failed to properly report adverse events experienced by the vaccine recipients. After the deaths of seven girls involved in the trial were reported, a parliamentary investigation concluded that the Gates-funded Program for Appropriate Technology and Health, or PATH, which ran the study, had been engaged in a scheme to help ensure healthy markets for GlaxoSmithKline and Merck, the manufacturers of the Gardasil and Cervarix vaccines that had been so generously donated for use in the trial. Had PATH been successful in getting the HPV vaccine included in the universal immunization program of the concerned countries, this would have generated windfall profit for the manufacturers by way of automatic sale, year after year, without any promotional or marketing expenses. It is well known that once introduced into the immunization program, it becomes politically impossible to stop any vaccination. Chandra M. Gulhadi, editor of the influential Monthly Index of Medical Specialties, remarked that it is shocking to see how an American organization used surreptitious methods to establish itself in India. And Samarin Nundi, editor emeritus of the National Medical Journal of India, lamented that this is an obvious case where Indians were being used as guinea pigs. Throughout the decade, India's concerns about the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and its corporate partners' influence on the country's national immunization programs grew. In 2016, the steering group of the country's national health mission blasted the government for allowing the country's national technical advisory group on immunization the primary body advising the government on all vaccination-related matters, to be effectively purchased by the Gates Foundation. As one steering group member noted, 
the NTAGI Secretariat has been moved out of the government's health ministry to the Office of Public Health Foundation of India, and the 32 staff members in that secretariat draw their salaries from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. There is a clear conflict of interest. On one hand, the BMGF funds the secretariat that is the highest decision-making body in vaccines, and, on the other, it partners with the pharma industry in Gavi. This is unacceptable. In 2017, the government responded by cutting all financial ties between the advisory group and the Gates Foundation. Similar stories play out across the Gates Foundation's decade of vaccines. There's the Gates-founded and funded meningitis vaccine project, which led to the creation and testing of MenAfrovac, a 50 cent per dose immunization against meningococcal meningitis. The test led to reports of between 40 and 500 children suffering seizures and convulsions and eventually becoming paralyzed. There's the 2017 confirmation that the Gates-supported oral polio vaccine was actually responsible for the majority of new polio cases, and the 2018 follow-up showing that 80% of polio cases are now vaccine-derived. There's the 2018 paper in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health concluding that over 490,000 people in India developed paralysis as a result of the oral polio vaccine between 2000 and 2017. There's even the WHO's own malaria chief, Dr. Arata Kochi, who complained in an internal memo that Gates's influence meant that the world's leading malaria scientists are now locked up in a cartel with their own research funding being linked to those of others within the group, and that the foundation was stifling debate on the best ways to treat and combat malaria, prioritizing only those methods that relied on new technology or developing new drugs. Kochi's complaint, written in 2008, highlights the most common criticism of the global health web that Gates has spun in the past two decades. That the public health industry has become a racket run by and for Big Pharma and its partners for the benefit of big business. At the time that Kochi was writing his memo, the executive director of the Gates Foundation's global health program was Tachi Yamada, Yamada left his position as chairman of research and development at GlaxoSmithKline to take up the position at the Gates Foundation in 2006, and left the foundation five years later to become chief medical and scientific officer at Takeda Pharmaceuticals. Yamada's replacement as head of Gates's global health program, Trevor Mundell, was himself a clinical researcher at Pfizer and Park Davis, and spent time as head of development with Novartis before joining the foundation. This use of foundation funds to set public policy to drive up corporate profits is not a secret conspiracy. It is a perfectly open one. When the Center for Global Development formed a working group to develop a practical approach to the vaccine challenge, they concluded that the best way to incentivize pharmaceutical companies to produce more vaccines for the third world was for governments to promise to buy vaccines before they were even developed. They titled their report making markets for vaccines. The project, uh, Making Markets for Vaccines, was really designed to address a a problem that's existed for a long time, which is insufficient research and development budgets, as well as investment capacity in vaccine development and production for the third world. How do you create better incentives to get the pharma community, the vaccine community, to produce products that are specifically dedicated for the developing world. Michael Kremer, a professor at Harvard, had been thinking about this problem for many years. He realized that if the rich countries of the world were to make a promise that they would buy a malaria vaccine if somebody produced it, that that would give an incentive to the pharmaceutical industry to go and do the research and development needed to make one. But this idea was unfamiliar. No government had made a commitment to buy a product that didn't already exist. When the first such advanced market commitment was made in 2007, a $1.5 billion promise to buy yet-to-be-produced vaccines from big pharma manufacturers, there was the Gates Foundation as the only non-nation sponsor. The Gates-founded Gavi Vaccine Alliance is an open partnership between the Gates Foundation, the World Health Organization, the World Bank, and vaccine manufacturers. Their stated goal includes introducing new vaccines into the routine schedules of national immunization programs, and to engage in market-shaping efforts to ensure healthy markets for vaccines and other immunization products. If introducing new vaccines and ensuring healthy markets for them was the aim of Gates' decade of vaccines, there can be no doubt that COVID-19 has seen that goal realized in spectacular fashion. 
Let's start the pledging. The EU kicked off its fundraising drive with €1 billion. Euros. In the hours that followed, pledges were beamed in from across the globe. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has pledged $500 million. Even pop icon Madonna made a last-minute donation of a million euros. By combining the world's expertise and brain power and resources, we can attack this disease in the way it's attacking us, globally. Our foundation is proud to partner with you, and I'm pleased to announce today that we will pledge $100 million towards this effort. Germany was one of the leading donors, pledging over 500 million euros. The money is earmarked for international health organizations and research networks in a bid to speed up the development of a vaccine. And there, at the center of this web, is the Gates Foundation, connected to every major organization, research institution, international alliance, and vaccine manufacturer involved in the current crisis. Certainly, the Gates like the Rockefellers, have profited from their years as the most generous people on the planet. As curious as it might seem to those who don't understand the true nature of this monopoly cartel, despite all of these grants and pledges, commitments of tens of billions of dollars, Bill Gates' personal net worth has actually doubled during this decade of vaccines, from $50 billion to over $100 billion. But once again, we come back to the question, Who is Bill Gates? Is he motivated simply by money? Is this incessant drive to vaccinate the entire population of the planet merely the result of greed? Or is there something else driving this agenda? As we shall see next time, money is not the end goal of Gates' philanthropic activities. Money is just the tool that he is using to purchase what he really wants. Control. Control not just of the health industry, but control of the human population itself. Next week on The Corbett Report. So Melinda and I wondered whether providing new medicines and keeping children alive, would that create more of a population problem? Researchers are now developing a vaccine that is delivered using a dissolvable patch called a microneedle array. In Gates' vision, these digital identities will be tied to all of our actions and transactions. Once you have that digital infrastructure, the whole way you think about government benefits uh, can be done differently. And so it's too bad if somebody thinks that creates a privacy problem. Bill Gates and the Population Control Grid.